This is PodKit, episode 34, related but distinct, on November 20th, 2017. And now, low latency and high bandwidth. This episode of PodKit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersat. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk34. Hello. Hello. It's been a minute. It's been a hot minute. Truly indeed. Well, it's good to be back, though. Definitely. So, what's uh, what's been new in our in our world of Twitter, where we talk so very much with each other? We do talk I, a lot. I feel like you can talk even more now. Uh, yeah. Almost double. Almost exactly double, even, than one used to be able to. So I don't know when this happened. Did this happen in, since the last time we recorded it? Or did it actually happen before that and we just forgot? No, it happened uh, in the past three weeks, I think. Now, I do think in the uh, before last episode, Podcast 33, they did allow it for a select number of users. They're kind of doing a, a beta test of it. And there were some browser extensions or JavaScript things that you could run that would um, enable overwrite. It. Or, yeah, enable it, cool. I guess. So that was around, I think, but... I remember it being something that was like a front-end toggle, basically, or something that where you could pass a parameter or override a parameter in the URL uh, that you post a tweet to, uh, yep. and it would, just, it would just roll. Yeah, I just looked it up. It was uh, November 7th when Twitter rolled this out to a more global audience. So what we're talking about is Twitter now allows users to not only share the regular in the old days 140 characters but also now up to 280 characters um and that's a pretty big deal because that doubles the length of what a tweet can be um and in addition to some of the other changes they made earlier this year which which is uh around linking so links no longer take up space if they're an image or something is that right and- um, yeah, I think all links don't count. Okay, all links don't count, and no. in addition to that, if you reply to users, those usernames don't count. So you can reply up to like 100 people at once and get for some very strange-looking tweets that are mostly just at replies. Yeah. So there's there's some interesting stuff going around on Twitter. So, um, you know, it's been about two weeks since this happened. Um, have you guys noticed any substantial changes or differences in what you've been reading on Twitter because of this? Um, some threads I've seen are fewer number of tweets, but same number of, or same amount of text, mm. I think. Um, I would guess that a, a lot of people who do big, long tweet threads are writing it somewhere else and then pasting it in chunk by chunk. Um, I am noticing that maybe my number of unread tweets is more or less the same, but it takes a little longer to get through them. Um, Yeah. And some things are a little more wordy than before. They're maybe a little more concise because you could fit it into one tweet, but now you might as well just blabber on more and more because you can. Yeah, for sure. I think for the most part, uh, the 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 type of tweets that people make remain the same. But I, I'm I'm kind of with you with you guys that it's it feels almost like uh, people are able to get a little bit more complete of a thought. Not that much, but a tiny bit more complete. And uh, yeah, that's kind of what my experience has been too. I've seen, I've seen the same kind of content. It's just it's a little bit more polished. It can it can just be, you know, five words longer, but just make that much more sense. Exactly. Yeah, I've definitely liked it. I mean, even today, I was tweeting something at work about I'm getting Spotify songs from like other countries and things, and that wouldn't have fit into one tweet. So I probably would have split it into two or like butcher the grammar and punctuation just to squeeze it into one but now i don't right. have to and that's quite nice yeah I, I i think the change has been really positive um kind of sad that it took you know this long to do it um so what do you think the next big like architectural change to tweets should be well twitter also was talking about changing their verified user process and have it less of an endorsement and more of a uh, status uh, kind of maybe I butchered how they were trying to explain that but that was a week ago um, I don't know I think the next thing Twitter really needs to do is focus on abuse and um, harassment on the platform 
that's kind of been a, a big issue for a long time now. Yep. Yeah, for sure. And I think like one of the one kind of major components of that, and I, I, I say this, uh, you know, as somebody who's built a lot of automated Twitter bots, I think part of it too is like um, maybe paring down like uh, the fraudulent bots, right? Um, Cause there are a lot of them and there are a lot of harassment bots too. Right. I think that's, that's not uh, the only thing, but I think it's something that it, it feels like that's pretty darn low hanging fruit. And I mean, there, there are a lot of low hanging fruit kind of items that uh, it feels like Twitter can handle. Yes. So Firefox quantum new version of Firefox version 57 57 can you believe it do you remember uh way back in the day when we had uh firefox 3 coming out and it was the biggest deal since sliced bread yeah i remember going from firefox 3.6 to to 4 and it was like what already but 3 came out relatively recently because yeah. 2 was like 2 was the version forever and then 3 4 5 6 seven, you know then it did single numbers every what, do they go every six months or? Um, I don't know what their release cycle is. It's like it's it's probably a little bit longer than Chrome's, but not too much longer. Yeah. So what's what's new? What's new in in Firefox Quantum? So um, there's a few things. Uh, one of the big things is its new UI. It's um, you know you know how uh, you know how everything's been really bubbly and uh, kind of uh, curved lately. Well. Uh, Firefox is also kind of shedding some of those curves, and they kind of have a more square and more modern esque UI look and feel. So edgy, uh, but it's not edge. That's the joke. So <laughs> um, another important thing is they actually have a new CSS something or another. Um, what is it? What is that called? It's um, called uh, Stylo, okay. and it's their new CSS selector engine or engine in general, I guess. Um, it's not a new rendering engine, so it's 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 kind of a weird distinction to make. But now it can it can uh, do much more because it's coded in Rust instead of uh, an old JavaScript and C plus plus U. Um, so that's really cool. Um, they've also done a lot of work um, earlier this year on multi process isolation, so that when one tab crashes or has poor performance, the others don't necessarily suffer from it. Um, and then another interesting thing that they did is they dropped their previous version of um, their plugin or extension architecture. So previously they were using so- something called XUL, I believe. Is that right? Mm. Yeah. Sounds right. And uh, XUL had some uh, some performance issues, some security issues, and it was just old and not very modern or extensible and certainly not interoperable with anybody else in the browser market at this time. Um, so there's something called web extensions, I think is what they're called. And these new web extensions allow um, not just Firefox, but presumably other browser vendors to um, implement sort of a universal extension platform by just exposing APIs to you know extensions. So um, in theory, everything eventually that was possible before will be possible now. So that's good. I like the idea of a common extension API. Yeah. I'm so tired of being on Safari and, oh, nothing works. Or I guess Edge kind of has that deal with now, too, because Firefox and Chrome are so ubiquitous. Yeah, for sure. Um, another notable thing, they've changed 7 million lines of code for this release. That's a lot of code. So that is a I'm lot sure of with code. New speed and new features. There's also tons of new bugs and vulnerabilities, but hopefully those will be ironed out as time goes on. But, you know, and one of the this... best things about coding something in Rust is that there's a whole class of vulnerabilities that can never happen in Rust. So there's never going to be a buffer overflow. There's never going to be, uh, you know, some kind of timing issue because of, um, you know, shared pointers. It's it's much more safe in some respects. So, you know, they, they did a great job. Good thing. I think this was, I was reading some article, this is Firefox's, third attempt at rewriting this <laughs> this feature i guess or this whole area yeah and so i think they've learned a lot from their first two miss attempts with c plus plus and now you know a third approach with rust is probably the the keeper yeah i mean rust isn't a solution to everything of course you know writing code in rust you know if you think about like you know magnitudes of of overhead writing something in javascript is like a one 
And writing in Rust is like a 10. You know, yeah. it's not nearly as easy. And they also release a new icon that's a little more saturated and vibrant. That Firefox tail sticks out a little more. I really I personally like, like it. it. Yeah. I think it, it it's a little more modern. It's a little flatter, but also, um, I don't know, just modern, new, a little refreshing. Totally. And I think one, one of the things that's really nice about Firefox Quantum is uh, that it kind of... Uh, a lot of us had a chance to try it out a little bit with uh, Firefox Developer Edition, which, in my opinion, is like that, that's my new kind of uh, browser for for software development. I think um, I still use Chrome quite a bit, particularly because a lot of the React tooling in, in Chrome is pretty first class. But uh, the thing about Firefox Developer Edition is like when I'm on a Windows computer, that is you know bar none the browser I I like to use, and in no small part, it's kind of because deep down I know. It's uh, running a lot of Rust. <laughs> Admitted. Rust. Uh, yeah. But they've, they've done a really good job. They've definitely brought Firefox, Firefox back to this like uh, to this point where people think of it again, right? In the well, same breath as Chrome, it feels like. I, I think that might be true for uh, developers like us, at least. But I, I, I think there's know, a, lot to, a lot to be asked about for regular people. That's true. That's true. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of like people who are... Uh, like not not software developers but who i work with like and that's you know they're, uh, they're, there's something about proximity i think like that's fair. first of all that's your fair. coworkers know what another browser is you've that's already true. won that is true that is true <laughs> they know enough to uh lambast me for my uh, uh web kit fandom yep they there you go know enough to make fun of me for that so there we go so one last fun fact about Firefox Quantum. They have a little fun facts area, and one of them is how many ways can you customize the toolbar in the new Firefox? And they say there are, and I won't read the whole number, 265 decillion numbers or ways to customize the new Firefox toolbar right out of the box. How did you know there was decillion? I counted like five minutes ago. That's amazing. <laughs> that you know, maybe I will, I will splice in some audio of text-to-speech saying it. Do you think, do you think it actually could? Oh, I'm sure. Wow. Uh, so for those keeping track at home, uh, Decillion is uh, a one followed by 33 zeros, which is uh, too much. That That is that is too many ways, I think, to uh, have a toolbar configured. But that's pretty cool. Oh, shoot. Was it Nonillion? Um, according to oh. Wolfram Alpha. Oh, bummer. I miscounted. My apology, dear listener. 265 nonillion 252 octillion 859 septillion 191 sextillion 742 quintillion 656 quadrillion 903 trillion 69 billion 40 million 640,000. So for those keeping track at home, that's a one followed by 32 zeros. <laughs> <laughs> for those keeping a track at home, you've already lost count, I hope. <laughs> This the the fact that that is there is, means I've played way too much Adventure Capitalist <laughs> on my phone for the last couple of years. So there's one more thing I'll mention about Firefox Quantum. So apparently, and I haven't actually had a chance to use them yet. Um, apparently, the uh, the developer tools have totally been rewritten. So mm-hmm. Firebug, which was the original like savior of the web, um, you know, best thing ever, it uh, left. Because it was one of the old extension types that were yeah. deprecated, the XUL extensions. But the new extensions are, um, you know, it's just, it's just a regular extension that's just built in, though. And it is super good. Like, Absolutely. it works just fine. It's super slick and fast. And this is the future by far. You, you've inspired me to write code with Firefox tomorrow. Yeah, and actually, I've actually been doing that. Um I have uh, two browsers open pretty much all the time now, and it's it's just Chrome and Firefox, and I and I use Firefox for um, increasingly more searching and googling. Yep, I'm with you. I think it's it the their rewrite of the dev tools has to be probably my favorite thing about uh, about Quantum and about Developer Edition. Uh, yep, but it's spilling over into other things. It's totally spilling over into other things. All right. Well, I think that was Firefox. Cool. So I'll tell you about something that's kind of fun. So about three months ago, maybe, um, my company, Doherty, had a uh, kind of a, an opportunity to host a HackerX event of their of, of, of other companies. So not their own HackerX event, but just 
host a public one. So if you if you don't know what HackerX is, it's kind of this speed dating, speed recruiting kind of thing where you go in, you have your resumes, you, you just talk to the people. It's kind of a networking event. It's kind of fun. Um, and while I was there uh, participating with the Doherty team to recruit people, I guess, um, I actually met a cool, cool uh, kid named uh, Matthew Dangerfield. I guess that's his last name, I hope. But I, I, for sure, Matthew is his first name. <laughs> if if um, nothing else, that's a superhero name. Exactly. Um, and so uh, he actually uh, was uh, somebody I met there, which I thought was super cool. And for some reason, he knew me, like he knew to come and talk to me because, like, I'm the view guy at Doherty, um, which is great because I am the view guy at Doherty. But I don't know how he found me. But anyway, so we talked for, I don't know, about 15 minutes or so. Um, and he was really cool. And so then we, uh, followed each other on, uh, LinkedIn later and, you know, we've stayed in touch a little bit. And, uh, he actually went to the, uh, Evan Yu workshop at Frontend Masters in September. Oh, yeah, yeah. Nice. And, uh, he really liked it. And so he sort of, um, he sort of kind of recapped how it's done. Like, what is the magic and what is the meaning behind that magic? So, uh, he made a post here on Hacker Noon, which is sort of a, really cool up and coming place for all sorts of tech news kind of like like not it tech like news medium, like that nobody but, cares about but like actual yeah. technical news um and he did a really great job of recapping how all of this works and it's a uh, really interesting really good read um one of the things that i really appreciate about it is that he mentions that there's kind of three ways of doing um like reactivity there's react with, with um set state and it kind of uses this proxy function to digest all of the n incoming changes and then dispatches updates as it you know sees them in whatever the new state is it sounds just like angular js is scope digesting <laughs> then there's angular's <laughs> dirty checking which is bad um and it just I, I i don't know how it works internally but i assume it just pulls occasionally or something and then there's views reactivity system which is instead of having a dirty checker or having kind of a method proxy, you have property proxies that just sit behind everything and just watch for any changes or, I don't know, accessors. So um, that's what he goes into, and it's super cool. Um, and if that wasn't enough, there was another one that recently um, came out, and this is from Norman, and I'm never going to be able to say this last name right, Coring? Maybe sounds solid, um, but Norman actually talks about something that's pretty similar, and um, he actually has a lot of cool examples that you can just run directly. Also, and uh, you know, it's the same kind of how does view internally work, um, and I think that's really good because there's a lot of mystery about how view works. And when I show view code to React developers, their first thought is, "Ew, I like set state." But then they, I, I keep forcing them to think about it, and they say, you know, that's not that bad. Totally. Absolutely. I really need to give you a little bit more of a, um, uh, of a, of a conscious look, uh, but because I'm, I'm starting well, to... Well, you can also look at it things. unconscious, too. I mean, either way is fine. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. But you're right. I'm, I'm kind of hitting those same walls with, with set state in some regards, and I think, like just uh having having taken a look at these articles in preparation for the show i'm with you i feel like there's definitely a lot of value to to that kind of uh approach so as a angular js developer so far at the moment this sounds like a a fun exciting new world of state management and things that i hope to eventually get to but time will tell so i think if you ever do get the chance to upgrade to a an angular like you know four or five project I feel like I've heard that they don't do dirty checking in Angular 4 or 5. Like, okay. I'm not sure, but I feel like that's what I might have heard once. <laughs> gotcha. I know my, my company is moving towards React for all new stuff. Hey, after the start good choice. Of the year, so I will likely go to there before I go to Angular 5. Yeah, that's that, to be honest, you'll enjoy that much better anyway. Uh, so let's talk about fonts. Everybody likes a good font every now and then. Good fonts are great. And Hashtag San Francisco. <laughs> of course. So 
one of the fonts that uh, you see a lot uh, when you uh, look on Twitter at all the hipsters code is this font called Fira Code, and it's a monospaced font with uh, programming ligatures. Now, what does that mean? Well, for example, if you type in uh, uh, exclamation mark equals sign, normally you would just see exclamation mark equals sign. That's what you would see on the screen. But what does that actually mean? It means not equals. Now, what's the symbol for not equals? Well, it's a two parallel bars with a slash through them. Now, that's what this font does. So it takes Ooh. your code and actually replaces combinations of characters with a single symbol that represents more acutely what it's supposed to mean in real life. So Ooh, if you ever... I like, that's if, awesome. It is pretty cool. Now, if you've ever seen like uh, an arrow function or in C, like a uh, C out pipe operator, um, you uh, normally see those as multiple characters, but with Fira code, you'll actually see them as a single character that's special. And it just looks, so, it, it, it has a really subtle look when you, when you apply it to your uh, code at first. But as you start, um, start rereading your code, you know, after having, you know, looked at it for weeks on end, you start noticing like, wow, that looks really interesting. So I only did it today. I mean, and it's totally changed the most minor of things, but it's quite, it, it stands <laughs> out quite a bit. Yeah, I'm going to have to install this in WebStorm tomorrow. That looks that looks cool. I I missed that when I was looking at this earlier. Yeah, that's really neat. So you can see um, on their GitHub page here what all of the symbol substitutions are, and it's it's pretty cool. Um, I I think it's funny that uh, like some of their names for arrows are decent arrows, because uh, <laughs> they actually look good. Finally, it reminds me just a little bit of like LaTeX, where yeah. you'd kind of insert characters like that. You know, it has that appearance of kind of a, a 90s look of special characters. But when applied correctly, it looks really good. And, you know, things like centering a a period next to an equal sign or something that yep. looks it just looks natural and looks like something someone designed it to look like that rather than just putting two characters there. And so it um, one of the things I've noticed in, in my React code recently is that it takes the spread operator and changes them into you know something more like an ellipsis and i think that's cool yeah because i know they're in unicode there's a character for ellipsis yeah but you know like ios will, will take three periods and turn it into ellipsis but having it in the font or well programming would be nice too now i will say there's one sort of like super minor downside so suppose you have a uh, a triple equals in your JavaScript code, which of course everybody does because everybody knows triple equals is the only way to test for equality. Well, if you need to change that triple equals to a not triple equals, well, what do you do then? So you have to go to the first character of that triple equals, but visually it looks like one character. So you have to delete a character that isn't actually there in order to change it over. And it feels kind of weird when you do that. So you just have to you have to get so used when to it. you so when you're using arrows when you go arrow over does it just jump the entire width it so does basically it does not jump the or? entire width okay. e each character is its own correct width somehow man yeah typefaces and font and kerning and all that stuff is quite interesting it's amazing it's over my head sometimes yep totally uh, I use a related but slightly distinct font called uh, Yosevka, I-O-S-E-V-K-A. Link is in the show notes because I'm not going to spell that out. Uh, <laughs> however, uh, it is more or less uh, similar to Fira code in the sense that it also has ligatures. But unfortunately, the terminal emulator that I use is uh, one that doesn't support ligatures in most cases, uh, which sounds dumb, I know, because most terminal emulators do, but... Uh, hear me out alacrity is written in Lust, rust and is very very good um very very quick very very speedy so the thing about yosefka that i really like is that um it it has uh, kind of a narrower profile so i can fit more code on a line and scan it a little bit more quickly but that said other people uh don't always like it for that exact same reason because it makes things look kind of packed together and uh the characters are taller than they are wide which is sometimes weird 
Uh, but one of the things that's really cool about this, I feel, is that they have all these different kind of what they call stylistic sets. So these are uh, groups of the font that uh, look closer to different ones. And Brian, there's a there's a Menlo style. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, Brian, there's a Fura Code style. Uh, so you can get the, the ligatures and you can get the, um, the glyphs to look like your favorite font. Uh, that you've used previously uh or you can just stick the stick with the uh the, the default which is what i do um it's it's a really really neat font and i'd highly recommend checking it out even if uh even if you're kind of uh a, a fan of uh of another one as well because you know we we all switch between fonts just like we all switch between terminal emulators and text editors and whatnot yep. terminal.app all the way only one i've used looks around wait really uh, yeah how's that possible okay what's wrong with the terminal.app <laughs> <laughs> there's much get, to learn for you. you i mean i've used the gnome turn gnome terminal that 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 vaguely counts but or not, i'll use git bash or webstorm's terminal okay all, all of those vaguely count but there's there's at least two that are too popular not to have used <laughs> i've looked at iterm but it's meh. yeah i don't know i like the the uh terminal that app all right i think we should talk about terminals here all <laughs> well, right so hyper.is yep. is what is one i feel like is this written in node um sure it's uh, electron based okay i feel like we talked about this at some point or i've seen it at some point well i don't I, they actually had a different name i think it was called hyperterm yeah and okay, then and then right. somebody like filed a trademark dispute against them and they had to change <laughs> their name to just Hyper, um, hyper term was such a better name for it because you know, hyper terminal. So it's super cool, um, and I actually use this on Windows because it you can change it to look however you want, and you can also make it look nice. Um, and it works great with um, you know like ZSH, and it actually works on Windows, which is a miracle. So um, truly, if you ever need a a, a good shell emulator for um, Windows. Try that one. Okay. I'll give it a shot sometime here. So this next one is one that's really near and dear to my heart. This is Alacrity, the one that I mentioned before. It's written in Rust, so it's super fast. Uh, but it also has kind of a really bare bones set of features. So um, while it's really neat to work with, uh, there are some things you run into and you're just like, why don't my font keys work? You know, it's control plus or control minus to, to uh, uh, resize the font in your terminal emulator. Well, you have to merge a, a, a pull request uh, or you, you have to get a patch for that basically and recompile and run that patched build of Alacrity, which is what I do. Um, it's kind of fun. It's kind of hacky, but it's, it's pretty great. Definitely worth a shot to you. Hmm. Yeah, I I didn't I hadn't heard of that, but I think that looks really like, cool because it's written in Rust. Um I might actually even just like go look at the source code because Rust it's in its installation ex- instructions it says don't use homebrew f- or don't use Rust from homebrew to install this or compile it. Yeah, so Rust updates a lot and so like homebrew probably lags behind a bit. That's what mm. I'm guessing. Yeah, it's so weird looking at Rust code. Um, and then the uh, like so the the other one on Windows that I I have used, but don't recommend that anybody actually use unless they have uh, <coughs> enterprise <coughs> reasons to do so. Um, is called Moba Xterm, and so Moba Xterm is a uh, it's not nearly as cool as the previous two, but Moba Xterm is a win an old style Windows um, complete like X visualizer if you need it kind of terminal oh, so thing. Like, so like um X11 yeah. for yeah. Mac OS so you can or, do you can do uh, full forwarding if you need to. Um and what's cool about it is, is that it works on Windows and you can install it like a normal application and it doesn't require that you have any other environment set up or you know you need um you know special stuff. Like it, it you can do SSH with it and that's what everybody wants. Yeah. Yeah. I mean it's a terminal. You got to do SSH. Exactly. X term. Oh, no, not X term. Sorry. X quartz is the thing I was thinking of for macOS. Yeah, it's probably different. Yeah. 
well, the Windows are term, uh, equivalent, maybe. Ish. Oh, right. Yes. Yes. I vaguely remember needing that once. All right. So some other new things were released recently. Yeah. Um, so teletype. Yeah. So this is pretty cool stuff. So, um, you know, from for quite a number of years now, there's been um, a few fairly decent, uh, like online IDEs with collaboration tools built in. So what comes to mind is Cloud9. Um, and Cloud9 is something where you can you kind of write code with another person if you want to. Um, even though that's not necessarily what it was for, it was really just an online IDE. Well, uh, last week, Teletype for Atom was released by GitHub, and what it lets you do is code together, and it's super cool. It's really awesome, and like one thing that I, I find particularly cool with it, um, having tried it out with my coworkers uh, in in our own office, uh, is that like, um, I, I use it a lot when I'm, even when I'm like sitting right next to somebody or not right next to them per se, but a lot of our desks are seated so that, um, I'm on, uh, my computer and my coworker's computer are back to back. And this sounds yeah. so ridiculous, but, um, you know, our, our home network is low latency as opposed to, uh, say for example, uh, the low latency and high bandwidth, one might say in comparison to, uh, kind of the the vastness of the internet that is between uh myself and you all right now uh but uh the the thing that's really cool about that is even over that um you know in that case over that very kind of high performance network we've got there um like it just makes it effortless right and like i can i can hear this person's voice and it's not like i'm on a call with them or anything but um you hear them in real life i hear them irl yeah and i can uh, I can work with them and demonstrate to them on their screen, vice versa, kind of what what changes I'm thinking of, what changes they're thinking of, and we can, like, make them, right? Like, it's literally, they, they use the phrase in their documentation, uh, portal, and it really is kind of like a portal, because um, it's no longer the sort of thing where, like, I, we both need to be looking at the same screen. We are looking at our own screens and using, um, uh, and, and kind of using our own machines, right? Uh but uh, they they and I both get to kind of work on the same code base. So that's really sweet. Definitely want to try it with some of my coworkers who are further flung uh, out in uh, California or New York, right? Um, yeah. Because yeah, that'd be quite cool to do. That's a, big, that's a big jump, right? From people who are literally on the same switch as you uh, to people across, uh, across the continent. So we'll, I'll let you know next time how that works out. I think an interesting thing here is... Um the how code gets shared section. So each portal comes to life in two steps. The first step is you connect to the GitHub servers, the the teletype servers. And it's just kind of like a handshake, like, hey, who's out there? And then after that, you actually share the code directly with the person you want to connect to through uh, WebRTC. So all of the traffic is encrypted over that connection and it never actually leaves, you know, you and or your partner's kind of jurisdiction which i think is super useful and kind of um kind of crucially important especially with uh code in certain circumstances absolutely uh and like that that just made me think too because we have like we're on the same uh we have like a vpn that's like shared across all our offices and i'm thinking that might kind of help that a little bit maybe not not a ton because it still has to hit um other like, like it's still tricky but it that would that'd certainly be better for us. And simultaneously, too, if we're sharing anything that's under particular kind of, uh, you know, secrecy concerns. Uh, exactly. That resolves it immediately. Yep. And so if Teletype wasn't enough to also, like, not only, like, get announced and receive last week, VS Code came out with something pretty similar, but also with some alternative features. So VS Code... Um, announced the eventual release of what they're calling visual studio live share um and guess what it does it lets you share code with somebody else live and they can edit edit it with you great cool they also demonstrated some other features such as interoperability between vs code and visual studio which is Mm. um alone something people have been asking for probably for as long as vs code's been around totally but but then also collaborative debugging, which I think is 
just extremely strange and also super cool. So not only can you get help with code itself, you can also get help figuring out how to debug your code remotely. Ooh. And it just it's just amazing how that probably works. So it's uh this is a limited preview right now, but eventually that'll uh start to come online. Um I feel like last week at, when this was uh, you know, all going down, that I heard that you would eventually have to pay for some of this feature stuff, but I don't know if I made that up or if those people just didn't know for sure yet. Yeah, no. that would make sense if they're paying for servers or something. Yeah, I've I've heard the same thing. And like one of the things that's interesting about this is this whole kind of handshake via a GitHub server or via a, a server owned by some company or some entity, and then conduct the rest of the communication over WebRTC is like that's a pretty tried and true pattern right there. That's um, like you can buy services to this effect from Twilio, basically, uh, and roll your own uh, system like this pretty, pretty darn quick. Um, yeah, and Twilio is not the only provider there. Amazon, of course, will sell it to you. Lots of lots of other companies do that sort of thing. Yeah, I think so. Like the problem with WebRTC for an average person or just an average developer is that if if you want to cover more than like forty percent of ideal connection scenarios you have to have your additional stun and turn servers all set up, ready to go. And then you have to have special code and just experience, I guess, with um, like peer-to-peer networking. Um, and you have to be able to figure out how to get stuff that belongs on the server, like usernames and permissions and you know that kind of stuff, yeah. metadata like that, down to the both users that need it but not be able to hydrate that data from a central server on connection time because the connection doesn't go through a central server. Right. So like there's some like experience is probably what I'm thinking is the, the differentiator there with uh WebRTC. Totally. Absolutely. Well So do you think it's that time? I think it is. That's exactly I what think I was it just is. gonna say. What is that time called? New Twitter followees. Pew 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 pew. Yeah, Alrighty. maybe we'll get a sound effect one day. Meow. Zoom, zoom. Yeah. Uh, That's the sound effect, <laughs> then. <laughs> so my first Twitter follow here today is uh, the Midwest Animal Rescue Services, or MARS. And um, this doesn't necessarily pertain to what we usually talk about, but pets are really great. Dogs are great. Cats are great. Um, uh, and uh, we, we, we like dogs and cats on this here show, so I thought I'd mention them because I just realized I just followed them on Twitter. Uh, members of my family have adopted dogs in this place and they're really, uh, they're the real deal. And, uh, you know, we, they're good folks. So there you go. That's the first one. Uh, the next, so I've heard, yeah, go for it. I've heard that, um, Twitter intentionally doesn't pull in thumbnails from Instagram and man, this, 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 you know, this Twitter feed, I, I mean, I love dogs and I love supporting, you know, animal, animal rescue stuff. But man, this page suffers so much because they're using Instagram and oh no. that Twitter isn't pulling in those pictures by default. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so uh, I would say uh, Tweetbot does pull in Instagram images, uh, which is probably why I did not notice. <laughs> that it does. And that is why, dear listener, you should use a third party Twitter client. Yeah, I, I just happened to notice because I'm using the uh, website as I sit here at this computer. So, man, that sure does suck. Politics. Well, in uh, Brandon's sad death of his computer, <laughs> well, his computer needed to be rebooted, so we shall continue without him, unfortunately. So my my first Twitter followee is uh, titled Casey List, but it's the account drunk underscore Casey. I don't know who runs this account, but I saw some retweet come up, and it looked like uh, a good account to follow if you're also following Casey List, which I also recommend. Um, just a little more of a uh, a joking approach to tech and Casey's life. Yes, uh, everybody everybody should have a uh, a drunk Twitter account. It's very important. Very important. Someday we'll get there. Uh, my next person is Dave Addy. Um, he seems to be someone who's interested in um, typography and looks like he's writing a book. And I saw something retweeted by him a couple of weeks ago looked interesting i followed him and yeah 
Oh, wait. No, I know what it was. He was doing a long t- Twitter storm about Pixar movies and um, localizing languages on that were on the screen towards different languages. So um, differences in how they word things that are, you know, on the screen in Wally, for example, in German versus English versus French or something. So I thought that was pretty cool. And my last one is biking in Minneapolis. I saw some retweet come up a while ago. I like biking. I live in Minneapolis. It kind of fits together, advocating for more bike lanes and things like that. It's always good. What about you, Ryan? Well, actually, I have followed some people, and I know that's hard to Whoa. believe. So we'll begin here with somebody that I used to follow on their own blog uh, many years ago. So there was a uh, cool, cool website. You know, this is kind of before, like, you know, like 2007, 2008 kind of timeline. You know, back yeah. in the heyday of Mootools and jQuery and Prototype and all those crazy things. So this is uh, Dion Elmer. Now, I did not know that he was a Google developer. I, I don't know if he was back then, but uh, he actually uh, tweets about a bunch of cool stuff. So I thought I would uh, finally follow him. Um, and one of the things that I always appreciate is when people that I think are super cool and who I have known about for a long time actually tweet about stuff I understand, which is always fun. Um, yeah. Number two is Noah Jorgensen. Uh, he, uh, does react and react native stuff. Um, and it says here on his Twitter profile that he's engineering at Twitter. Um, so that sounds pretty cool. Um, I'm all for anybody who's doing React Native, and uh, that's great. And then, let's see, who who else here? So, finally, um, I one of, this is really cool, too. So, uh, David Lyab, maybe? Lyab? Lyab? I don't Lyab? Know. So, uh, David yeah. actually is the product lead of Google Photos. Um, mm-hmm. Google Photos being probably one of the best apps that Google's made in the last, you know, eight years. Um Interestingly, though, he is the CEO, or he was previously the CEO of Bump. Now, Bump was a uh, app that allowed you to exchange contacts back in the day, and I actually remember talking about the acquisition of Bump by Google on Athenexus many, many, many years ago. So I thought it was kind of cool to stumble upon this person and follow them, yeah, and kind of see what your, they're saying. Your Twitter followers are. Old old follows viewers, yeah, but coming up again, yeah, and cool. I and I I think um I think that's really cool, and um you know one of the things that I'll say to that is, what's old is new again, definitely. Well, where can we find you on the internet? Well, you can find me on the internet uh, on Twitter at Ryan Amar, and of course on my website ryanrepresent dot com, and uh, you know you can also find Brandon um, at uh, Twitter at Brian, uh, Brandon underscore mn. I have no idea what his website is because he has dozens of them that are all down right now. Yeah, yeah you could try brandon.mn or uh, brndn.xyz <laughs> or github.com slash skyline project. Yeah, you could try all those things simultaneously and one of them might resolve. Uh, I don't know probably which. recommend Twitter, though. Probably yes. for all of us. Yeah, that's, that's I agree. the place to be. And you can find me on the internet at... Uh, Brian MN. Wow, that was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you can find me on the internet at my website, brianm.me, or on Twitter at Brian Mitch L. See, see, without Brandon here to keep us in light, we have no idea what we're, what we're supposed to say. We just fall apart without him. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what's going on anymore. Well, Brian, this has been an excellent show. Yes, it has. Um, and hopefully, we'll get some uh, better internet for Brandon and a more stable computer. Yes. Yep. Soon. Well, until next month, have a good one. Have a good one. Watch out for cars. You can find me just about anywhere, but especially on my website, brandon.mn, where I occasionally update uh, it with things that I do. Uh, For example, currently I'm training for a half marathon uh, and, uh, I don't know, writing more code, stuff like that. You can also find me on Twitter, where I'm brandon underscore mn. That's B-R-A-N-D-O-N underscore mn.